A new drama starts Wednesday, 9.30 on BBC Two. With a taste for the headlines, the boys Ken Livingston and Bob Monkhouse get the munchies. Have I got old news for you in an hour. Fifty-eight nights, fifty-eight emotions. The BBC Proms live on BBC Television and Radio Three. Now on BBC Two, definitely a legend in her own lifetime. Reputations tells of Maria Callas, the original diva. accused me of not being disciplined. I don't like to be told what to do because I know my job very well. I have been attacked. I have been hated. I don't like it. But if I have to defend myself, I have that much pride to say, well, there's no way out. Go ahead and defend yourself. Because I have so much good sense that it hurts. When she came to the Metropolitan to do Norma, I was determined to go and hear her. And I sat in that audience, actually upstairs, as a student. One dollar I paid to get in, and I listened. I became riveted on her figure, on what she was doing on stage. From that moment, I said to myself, so this is what opera can be. She actually screams. She's doing the thing that every soprano is told, don't do it. She doesn't float the top note. She goes straight through like a knife. She gave you more excitement in the theatre than another 10 singers put together. And to have seen her in the opera was everything. She had this eyes, this face, this figure. Are you kidding? Do you think you could take your eyes off that woman? Between 1949 and 1965, Maria Callas was the world's greatest diva, opera's first superstar since the days of Caruso. She packed every opera house she ever sang in, and even to this day, her recordings sell in their millions. People may still argue about the beauty of that voice, but few can dispute its power to move. By 1957, Maria Callas had spent 20 years clawing her way to her peak. Her voice and her temperament made her the most famous singer in the world, and its most controversial. Her next 20 years would be very different. The Elizabeth Taylor of opera was in Venice attending a ball given in her honor when she was introduced to her Richard Burton, Greek shipping tycoon, Aristotle Anassis. 
Their nine-year love affair ended in rejection and bitterness when Anassis dumped her to marry Jackie Kennedy. His betrayal would achieve what poverty, war, and obesity had not. It would undo Maria Callas and the titanic willpower that had created her. Oh, that terrible Callas I gained so much money in one evening. Oh, she is a capricious so, 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 so. Oh, she's an impossible person. It's a big destiny, man. It's terrifying. Mine is a big destiny. Christened Maria Kalagaropoulou, this most Mediterranean of stars grew up not in Athens, but in New York, closer to Broadway than to the Acropolis. She was born in a Fifth Avenue hospital on December the 3rd, 1923, and educated in public school 189 on the northern tip of Manhattan. Her parents were recent Greek immigrants. Her father, George, was a moderately successful pharmacist whose business was later ruined by the Wall Street crash. He changed the family name to Callas to help them fit in. Maria's mother, Evangelia, had never wanted to come and hated their life in New York, endlessly moving from apartment to apartment in the Washington Heights district. That was uh, really a broken marriage right from the beginning. The mother was a very aggressive person. The father was a retiring person who, when abused by his wife, just took his hat and went and had his own affairs outside. Maria's mother found her escape in her daughters. It was she who steered them into music, with Jackie, the older daughter, learning to play the piano. Maria, who never had Jackie's looks or figure, developed an early love of singing. Her mother seized on this, entering the 12-year-old Maria into numerous radio talent shows. All right, what do you want to sing? Something of Madame Butterfly. All right. A bit abbreviated. That's good. Go ahead. By 1937, Evangelia could bear it no longer. She was moving back to Athens and taking the girls with her. George stayed in New York. Safely back in Greece, Maria could start singing in earnest. But for all Evangelia's ambitions, life in Athens proved even harder than New York. The only way Maria could afford expensive singing lessons was to get a scholarship to Athens Conservatory with its principal teacher, Elvira de Hidalgo. But she was only 13, and to qualify, she had to be 17. To Maria's mother, the answer was simple. She pushed me, she put it into my mind, and uh, at a certain point when I was 13 years old, and I had to go into the conservatory in Greece, and uh, we lied about my age, and we said I was 17, and uh, they took me. Once in, Maria needed no further encouragement. When Nicolas came to the house of De Hidalgo, we heard her and we heard her and De Hidalgo to take her as a teacher. I would say that she was accepted by all of us, because she sang Aida, which is very powerful, the opera and the other one who sang και μας κατέπληξε και με τον τρόπο που τραγουδούσε, αλλά και με τον όγκο της φωνής της. Είχα μείνει άναυδος. She went to this woman called Elvira de Hidalgo, who was a little sort of nightingale, tweety, tweety, tweety singer. And Callas had this great, black, enormous, dramatic voice, which could sing Wagner, and which indeed did sing Wagner very beautifully in the 1940s. And instead of developing her as a Wagnerian soprano, taught her all her Tweety 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 songs. Uh, and it's this extraordinary combination of these two um, 
schools of music, if you like, which I think makes Callas so unique, and it's a sort of freak. I was supposed to study and not sing immediately, but I'm afraid it didn't last that long because after six months of uh, training with the Hidalgo, I was immediately taken, engaged, shall we say, by the then six months old uh, opera in Greece. But before she could sing her first professional role, Greece was sucked into World War II. Occupied first by the Italians and later the Germans, Athens witnessed suffering and atrocity. In the winter of 1941, when Maria was only 18 years old, 50,000 people died of starvation in Athens alone. But despite the carnage, neither the Italians nor the Germans would go without their opera. For this, they needed both the fledgling Greek national opera and as many of its singers as possible. Her mother seized this opportunity. In the desperate fight for survival, Maria would sing, earning the family a much needed income, as well as food, from private concerts given to the occupying forces. As well as salamis and pasta, the occupation gave Maria the chance to sing her first major role. Her professional debut was in an opera she would perform throughout her career, Puccini's Tosca. After singing it in Greek, she then sang it in Italian, to an audience of both Athenians and occupying officers. Maria tragoudouse me tous Italus, malon ya tous Italus, kia tous Germanus, ala isu na toka ni ya ya epiviosi, ya titane imiteres de tsi dene kamia simasia, ta para polifotia, foruse kaltes hodres, ena paltok seftismeno ke lipa ke lipa. Maria did uh, sing for the Italians on several occasions. She had one or two affairs with uh, Italians she fell in love with. There was a, a very brief uh, but uh, intense love affair with an Italian parachutist whom she met in the summer of 42, not even 19 years old. She was singing in a nightclub used for the entertainment of the occupation uh, forces. In 1943, it was the Germans who were in sole control of Athens, and Maria won herself two further leading roles. She did uh, enjoy the support of the German authorities in a quiet, discreet way, but uh, uh, it is obvious that she had it from the fact that in 1944 she uh, sang the leading roles in Tiefland and in Fidelio, the two first uh, German operas that were staged by the National Opera. Just a few weeks after Callas's performance of Fidelio in August 1944, the Germans were pushed out of Athens by the advancing British army. The Greeks could celebrate the end of the war, but also the settling of some old scores. On the day of the liberation, Maria went to the National Opera and she was met by various uh, singers, communists, who attacked her as uh, having no place here, who are you, what have you done during the war, and pushed her out. In fact, she exchanged blows with a chorus member who uh, spoke to her very insultingly. Her rivals got Maria banned from the opera company for three months. Maria returned to her nightclub and sang there. Now full of British officers rather than Italian or German, one in particular caught her eye. One evening, as uh, to get out of the barracks, out of the mess, I went to the Argentina nightclub. After a little while, a knock came at the door, and in came this girl, who Malekos, the manager of the Argentina, introduced me as Mary Caliera Pulu. And we clicked straight away and chatted and so on and danced. I mean, I knew a pretty girl when I saw one. Anyway, after that, we met many, many times. But one evening, we were at the Argentina. 
and the light went out, Aleka came up to Maria and whispered in her ear, and uh, a limelight came on at my table, which embarrassed me because it was full of English officers. And she got up and she sang. To me, I like to think. An, an aria. And I mean, it was tremendous. I hadn't seen her in that light before. And uh, when she sang, she was a different person. And uh, I saw, as I said there, the prima donna for the first time, really. But if one war was safely over, another one all too quickly took its place. By December 1944, Greece was in the grip of civil war between the communists from the north and a garrison of vastly outnumbered British soldiers trying to prevent them seizing power. Athens was once again a battlefield with the communists controlling whole areas of the city, including the street where Maria lived with her mother and sister. Suddenly you'd hear the communists shouting from way back through microphones, blood-curdling noise, coo coo a eh, coo coo a eh. And I said to her, what's that? What's that uh, awful sound? And she explained to me it was uh, the initials of the communist party, KKE. Terrifying. Every night, death squads roamed the streets on the hunt for anyone suspected of collaboration. I had phone calls, they sent signals, and so we learned that there was a friend of the Italian, and we saw with the Italian and German, if they didn't fall, Maria, in the Epanastasy, it may be that she didn't have been broken. When the Epanastasy came here, Ίσως ίσως να ήταν προδιαγεγραμμένοι για να την ε, σκοτώσουν. Όπως κάνανε με την Παπαδάκη. Μια δραματική του βασιλικού τότε θεάτρου της Πρόζας, την οποία κυριολεκτικά εσούβλησαν οι κομμουνιστές με ένα ξύλο, όπως κάνουν τα αρνιά. Not even the danger of communist retribution could undermine Maria's ambition. By 1945, she'd sung over 60 major performances and was bursting to make her international debut. Her father wired her $100 and her mind was made up. She would leave for New York. Her mother begged her to stay in Athens, but on the 14th of September, 1945, she set sail alone for America, ready to embrace her big career. Unfortunately, the world was not as ready for Callas as she was for it. She spent two whole years practicing and angling for work. Finally, in 1947, she was introduced to the organizer of the annual opera festival held in the Roman arena in Verona. He took the gamble and gave Maria a role singing La Gioconda. This was her big chance, but she was disappointed by lukewarm reviews. One co-singer criticized her for sounding as if she had potatoes in her mouth. Two years in America, surrounded by more food than she'd seen in five years, had also left Maria considerably overweight. But one man sitting in the audience was smitten. A balding millionaire, 30 years older than Maria, his name was Giovanni Battista Meneghini. It was as though God sent him to me because I was very alone. I uh, just loved the way he smiled. It was so open and, uh, well, you can't explain these. Love at first sight, I suppose, and it was. At last, Maria had two of the things she craved the most, the security of total affection and freedom from worries about money. They married two years later and she moved into his lakeside retreat, a villa on the banks of Lake Garda only too happy to live the bourgeois idyll. Her career, however, needed a jump start, and once again Verona would deliver it. 
After she made her debut in Verona and Gioconda, she couldn't get an engagement. She went six months without an engagement. The person who came to her rescue was Tullio Serafin, the conductor. And he became her great mentor. He became the great person who shaped her, as he had shaped Rosa Pancel before her. He was a genius man, um, uh, uh, one of the few conductors I've ever come across who understood the voice. Seraphim's faith in that voice was soon rewarded in a way not even he expected. They were in Venice working on two very contrasting productions. Maria was singing Wagner's dark and brooding epic, Die Valkyrie, while Seraphim was putting the finishing touches to an opera that could not have been more different, Bellini's lyrical masterpiece, I Puritani. Only days before it was due to open, Seraphim's soprano was struck down by flu. He needed a replacement fast. Curiously enough, Maria was overheard sight reading an aria from Ipuritani, news of which quickly worked its way back to Seraphim's office. So the next morning, early in the morning, Callas got a call from Seraphim who said, Would you please come to my room? And she said, well, Maestro, you know, I'm not dressed, I'm not... He said, doesn't matter, just put on your robe and come down as you are. She came down to his room and was surprised to see the general manager of La Fenice sitting there. And he said, sing. He said, what? Sing what you sang yesterday. was forced to sing the aria and the uh, sight read of course which was the second time the third time I sight read it I heard them talking and he says uh, to me well look Maria you're going to do this role in a week I said I'm going to do what in a week he says you're going to sing Puritania in a week I undertake that you study it I said I can't I have three more Valkyrias can't do it it's ridiculous that I sing Puritani he says, I guarantee you that you can. She still had a couple of performances of Valkyrie left. So for a short space of time, she was actually alternating one of Wagner's most dramatic roles with one of Bel Canto's lightest roles. And all of Italy was agog talking about this incredible feat that had happened. The following year, Seraphin took Callas to Central America. Here, she learned another lesson. Opera singers sing, but prima donnas astonish. At that time, the man who ran the theater told her the story and had the score to prove it, that the first singer who ever sang Aida in Mexico had interpolated and put in to the triumph scene to bring the house down a high E. And it's a kind of dare. Well, lo and behold, what does she do? She comes out in that triumph scene. And you don't have to worry about high notes there. Listen for how long she holds a high E in the triumph scene and brings the Mexicans down. I mean, they just go mad. Callas had triumphed in the standard roles. What she needed now were operas that would become distinctively hers. Seraphim had the perfect candidates, the so-called bel canto operas of the early 19th century, 
written by romantic Italian composers like Bellini and Donizetti. Written as showcase pieces for the greatest divas of their time, they hadn't been properly performed for decades. With a voice and an ambition like Callas's, they were ripe for rediscovery. They were a perfect showcase for her power and versatility. Irresistibly, too, these were great female roles. Women in love, women betrayed, women driven insane, meat and drink to Callas the actress. These operas would form the backbone of her career, with one role in particular becoming her masterpiece. Norma, Norma, Norma. From the very first word, it was a battle cry, and she never relented. Bellini's Norma is an epic story of heroism and betrayal, of a druid priestess in revolt against the might of the Roman Empire, but in love with one of its generals. Callas would sing the part 89 times in a career of over 600 full opera performances. It became her signature role. She's stupendous as Norma, and she takes it into the realms of really high art, becomes almost abstract and completely absorbing. Ένας ρόλος που ακροβατεί συνέχεια, ε, βασίζεται σε μια εναλλαγή συναισθημάτων καταπληκτική. Δηλαδή η ίδια σκηνή μπορεί να αλλάξει ατμόσφαιρα σε συνέστημα μέχρι και δέκα φορές. Και για την Κάλλας αυτό ήταν κάτι φυσικό. Ο νόρμα της εξελισσόταν ε, μαζί με εκείνη. Δηλαδή στις αρχές ήταν ένα πρόσωπο πολύ πιο δωρικό, πολύ πιο γενικό και σιγά σιγά όταν και η ίδια άρχισε να διεισδύει μέσα στη δραματική τέχνη, ε, το, 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 η νόρμα της αποκτούσε πολύ περισσότερες λεπτομέρειες. Και φυσικά, ε, μαζί με την εξέλιξη του προσώπου, εξελισσόταν και ο τρόπος που τον τραγουδούσε, και όχι μόνο που τον ερμήνευε. Ε, ώστε έφτασε στο τέλος, στο τέλος της καριέρας, είναι ο τελευταίος μεγάλος ρόλος που είπε στο θέατρο, σχεδόν πεθαίνει με αυτήν. She was an extraordinary singer because she was a very nervous woman, very nervous singer. 
and she would begin an opera and it was nearly always bad. I saw her sing Norma 11 times. The first act was from mediocre to atrocious. The second act was always a lot better and the third and fourth acts were nearly always glorious. I would call her one of the greatest uh, artists of all time in so far that she gave you more excitement in the theatre than another ten singers put together. But she wasn't, the voice was not always beautiful. In fact, it was very ugly a lot of the time. If you expect a beautiful sound, Italian style, those sweet, round, soft, fantastic. No, Callas didn't have that. But she wouldn't get attention with that kind of sound. This was even more obvious when Callas was compared with her only serious rival, Renata Tobaldi. A year older than Callas, she was the darling of La Scala and had a voice that could not have been more different. Don't stand up and be perfect. Perfect is very boring. Show me a few flaws, I'll accept them, but give me a couple of goosebumps as I go along and I'll take anything else you want to offer me. Yes, there were moments of shrillness, but that shrill quality, if you wanted to call it shrillness, was always for a purpose. She was willing to take a chance. Pavarotti said to me that the tenor voice is an urlo educato, it's an educated yell, while the soprano's voice is a scream. And Callis gives you that. She gives you the cry of pain. But what is amazing about it is the control. She never loses it, except if the voice cracks, but she still hasn't lost her control because she's doing that thing that she does of, of building up the tension until the, the wire is so tight. It's so plangent, and there is no relief. It becomes a more and more desolate sound. By 1952, Callas had fulfilled all her early ambitions. She'd made a triumphant debut at Covent Garden and opened her first major season at La Scala. At the age of 29, she was a prima donna with the world at her feet. But one thing tormented her, her weight. Since childhood, she'd adored her food. But by 1952, she was obese. She was really enormous, and when she came onto the stage the first time I saw her in Norma, it was like watching Gary Cooper stride around the stage in a, in a, in a western, you know, with her hands cr cr across the, this enormous bosom which she had. I remember her telling me one day that she became so impatient with herself. She said, look, Maria, you've worked so hard to put your voice right. Why don't you do something about your body, too? She was doing Medea at that point, and she said that she'd tried darkening under the chin and everything, and none of that worked. To be slim and to be beautiful was terribly important to her, to Maria, the woman. And suddenly she started losing weight. Um, and what she explained to me was that she, she ate a great deal of, of raw meat, of steak tartare. And so she ate steak tartare and she got a tapeworm. And that was the beginning of her slimming. It wasn't done purposely, but that's what happened. The weight loss was, was something so dramatic and in such a short time. I tell you that I didn't recognize her when, when I met her uh, and we 
just, I was just in the, in the entrance downstairs of the stage, stage door of Scala, and she started, of course, la look at me laughing, came to embrace me, and then, then I realized it. But I had a moment of, uh, who is she? In October 1956, she was paid the ultimate compliment of the front cover of Time magazine. But the accompanying article dragged into the daylight something she'd preferred to keep hidden, her resentment and loathing for the woman who'd been her early driving force, her mother. I'll never forgive her for taking my childhood years away. During all the years I should have been playing and growing up, I was singing or making money. Everything I did for them was mostly good and everything they did to me was mostly bad. The breakdown in their relationship had been years in the making. Both were women with tyrannical willpower who had long bickered and feuded. But when Evangelia wrote Maria a begging letter for a monthly pension of $100, Maria exploded. I asked Maria if she would send me $100 a month but Maria, rich as she was, wasn't rich enough to spare her mother a hundred dollars or even one dollar a month. Mother, Maria's letter began. I have your letter. I can give you nothing. I bark for my living. You are a young woman. I was 54. And you can work. If you can't earn enough to live on, throw yourself out of the window. Is this a, a proper quote? She said, Mother, I can give you nothing. You are a young woman, and you can work. Yeah. Unquote. Now, that yes. was uh, eight years ago. Yeah. Make she doesn't living. care if I live or not. Maria cast her mother into outer darkness and never spoke to her again. Mama Callis, when is the last time you heard your the daughter, Maria, sing in person? Ten years. Ten years? You say that mm -hmm. a friend of yours uh, called Maria when she was here in New York and said, there's somebody here who would like to speak with you, your mother. And no. uh, uh, is, it, uh, uh, is it true that she wouldn't even speak to you knowing yes, that, that she was true. there? Oh, yes, it's true. Otherwise, I could write it in my book. She used blackmail, unfortunately. And I don't like blackmail by anybody. A mother, there is nothing extraordinary about, oh, how wonderful a mother she is. She's got to be wonderful. Otherwise, don't have children. But if you do, well, you just be a good mother, period. And don't expect anything in return. That is what she's supposed to do. On stage, Callis's relationships were more successful. Callis would team up with the two men who became her most important collaborators, Italy's greatest directors of cinema and opera. Lucchino Visconti, and later, Franco Zeffirelli. It was their sure eye for gesture and understatement that enabled Callas, now looking like Audrey Hepburn, to achieve total theatre. Everything about her was really too big. I mean, the eyes were too big, the nose was too big, the mouth was too big. But these were the very things that carried that face into a house, that carried it like a cinematic close-up almost, and made every little emotion on that face and those eyes register with you. There are a lot of people who, not having seen Collis, 
imagine her sort of, I don't know what, a, like a mad woman rushing around the stage with gestures. No, no, not at all. What she did was very, very, almost slow motion and uh, very contained and very almost understated. But what mattered was that when she did do something, it was so perfectly one with the music. And when she did make a grand gesture, when she threw those arms out, it was like the fingertips went from one side of the stage to the other side of the stage. It was just immense. Ever since she'd lost weight, Callis found it harder and harder to push her voice to its limits. There were plenty of opera goers only too happy to pounce on her errors, especially at La Scala, opera's gladiatorial arena. She had enemies, she had detractors, she had people who didn't like the voice, people who thought there was too much wobble. If you went in, you could feel a buzz around the place. Almost everybody was waiting for the excitement of her failing. I have certain colleagues that uh, pay to have me booed. It's been going on for six years. At the Scala, each evening, or practically each evening, I have uh, to deal with these uh, so-called booers in the theater. So you see, I really don't run away from my work. In fact, I'm used to uh, fighting, though I don't like fighting. Of course, I fight if I have my weapon. My only weapon is my voice. Callas fought her most famous stage duel with her La Scala tormentors while singing Donizetti's opera, Anne Boleyn. Simeonata, the mezzo-soprano, came on as, as Jane Seymour, and she was a very good singer, excellent singer, and very popular in the Scala. There was tremendous applause, as was appropriate. But when Callas came on, there was total silence. People sat on their hands. Prove it. She begins having been accused by Henry VIII, her husband, Anne Boleyn's character, had been accused of adultery. And he says, right, well, I shall have you up in front of the judges. And she sings to, the, to, the, to him, Giudici, Adana. And she yelled it at the balcony at the top row of the scholar who'd received her in absolute total silence and led this thing again as a, almost a demonstration of her own, uh, uh, her own personal magic until again it brought the house down and she turned uh, a, 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 a suspicious, rather hostile, rather unpleasant audience, I was there, right round and the performance became a triumph. Off stage two, Callas showed she had claws when cornered. It was while singing in Chicago that the world at large got its first glimpse of Callas the Tigress. Eight years earlier, she'd signed a contract with an agent called Eddie Bagarozzi, something Maria had conveniently forgotten, but he had not. As she finished the punishing final act of Madame Butterfly, a shock awaited her in the wings. The process server showed up at the final performance, which was the special extra performance of Madame Butterfly. And as she came into the wings from her final bow, he handed her the subpoena. He, he tried to hand it. She did not accept it. She, she put her hands back, and he sort of put it on her chest, but she let it fall to the ground, and she went into a terrible rage. 
She screamed out in, on a high note. <laughs> you can't do this to me. I am an angel. And the photographs which were made by the newspapers who were all present, I did invite them because I knew it would be a, uh, be a historic picture. It was used all over the world. But the tigress was about to fall prey to an even bigger predator. In the two years since he'd been first introduced to her by society hostess Elsa Maxwell, Aristotle Anassis had grown more and more fascinated by his fellow Greek superstar. In the summer of 1959, he invited Callas and Meneghini on board his yacht, the Christina, for a Mediterranean cruise. Once on board, he could stalk her in earnest. And by the end of the voyage, they were more than just friends. <laughs> She was in love. Disaster. Absolute bloody disaster. The meeting with the nurses was an absolutely crucial turning point in her life. I think there are all sorts of things. I think to begin with, she really fell in love for the first time. And I'm sure she remained in love with the nurses. Really, genuinely in love. Managini was reduced to the role of comic cuckold. Callus would have no further use for him. Uh, one of the, uh, the headlines in, uh, in an Italian newspaper, because I was in Italy at the time, said, uh, Mr. Managini calling it that damned boat. <laughs> As if he was talking about some mysterious boat of Greek mythology. She had been working, working, working like an animal because she was a workaholic. And when this love story happened, because it was a love story, it was absolutely necessary in her life because she couldn't continue even with a very calculated speed. But I mean, she could not emotionally all the time sustain the speed. Don't forget that she was, she was a lady of 35 years old and she needed to have also something more than a career with a big C. And what a career. Anassis was a highly sexed man, and compared to Menengini, it's like comparing the Greek army with the Italian army, which is much better. I've never seen anybody who was happier than to be retired and living on Anassis's boat than her. She had worked since the age of 12, she wanted to see the rest of the world f f instead of sitting in a drafty studio singing. And there were other powerful pleasures. The world's greatest diva was crowned queen of high society, more famous now for her private life than for her singing. Why did you, why did you cut short your trip? Me, please. Are you going to marry Mr. I said don't. I'm not answering any interview. Now stop it. Have you talked to Mr. Onassis? She now habitually spent more time in the pleasure spots of Europe under the glare of the world's press than in any rehearsal room. I'm answering no more questions. Elsa Maxwell said to me, I am to blame for Maria's downfall. Uh, I mean, the, literally those words, because she, she introduced uh, Maria to the Café Society. And uh, Maria, what she wanted too much. She wanted to have a great voice. She wanted to be the greatest diva in the world. She wanted to look like Audrey Hepburn. And she wanted to, to uh, run around the world to all the society parties. Nobody can do all that. She, she, she was, in that way, she was very greedy. And she wanted too much. The one thing that he did not care about was music. And the question arose in the minds of people who think a lot about music. What was she wasting her time with? Someone, never mind his millions, she had money. So in a way, my way of thinking, Onassis wasn't worthy of her. She began to spend less time at her voice and her work 
and then things began to develop. And from that, she developed a fear uh, because things were not going as they were before, and she couldn't totally depend on her voice the way she once had. And so the, the act of performing became a more and more terrifying specter to her all the time. By 1964, it took Maria's favorite director, Franco Zeffirelli, to persuade her back on stage, singing in productions of Tosca and Norma in London, Paris, and New York. What nobody knew at the time was that these would be her last ever full performances on an opera stage. She was by now preoccupied by only one thing, persuading the ever-reluctant Anassis to marry her. There was no loophole too small for her to try, particularly as Meneghini refused to grant her a divorce. Given up your uh, citizenship, that's correct? Yes, that is correct. And you're taking your Greek citizenship back? I've already taken my Greek citizenship. What is the reason behind this, Madame Callas? Well, the real reason I could even say it is that I am a free woman, you see. Because uh, during, um, with the Greek law, who is not married after 1946 in church mm -hmm. is not married. So you understand? I understand completely. And now, do you have any intention to marry Mr. Onassis? Oh, well, those are not questions to... Uh, no, right now I'm a free woman. I'm very happy to be so. That is why I had to give up this American citizenship, unfortunately. You, can't, you understand. But Callas, the free woman, was devastated when in 1968, Anassis married the world's most famous widow instead of her, Jackie Kennedy. like a woman has every right to be able to fall in love with somebody else. There are no chains for love, no regrets. Oh, no. Otherwise, I would have married him. I had every occasion. But behind the facade, Maria knew only too well what her years with Anassis had cost her. For nine years, you've been living a hidden life and a humiliating life for a person like I am. It gets you, John, and you're not cured in two months. I'm quite sure that you did not do it on purpose. I'm quite sure. I know that. But then, on the other hand, I say also, yes, so then if it is that way, you should be strong enough to, uh, you know, forget, to live above everything. You know, be patient. The hurt's there, and I can't get rid of it. But nine years, I've given up a hell of a career for nothing. But if she couldn't have Anassis, there was one last remaining love affair that did still beckon, her adoring public. In 1973, she staged a worldwide comeback of gala concerts, beginning in London's Festival Hall. Behind the cheers of those too young to remember the glory days lay a voice coarsened by eight years of neglect. I must say this evening I was a little more emotion than usual because when a public loves me that much, I have to give that much more. So I'll try a little more and I'll do the usual song, which I say, O mio babbino caro, or my public caro. I saw her at her last concerts at Festival Hall in, I think it was 1973. And I say saw her because what one heard was grisly and it made your toes curl up with embarrassment. I mean, it couldn't have been worse. It, it couldn't have been a worse memory of those, those people who saw her. It was as if she was out of voice at a rehearsal. But I do remember my wife and I saying on that occasion, 
But look, we can't go around. We just can't go around. What does one say? And we didn't go around. The next day, I talked to her on the telephone, and she said, you didn't come around. I said, no, my dear, there have been so many people. And she said, I left your name on the door. The tour ended a year later, in 1974. Less than 12 months on, Anassis was dead. He and Maria had been parted for nearly seven years. But with his death, the clock started running down on her life, too, even though she was barely 50. Everybody abandoned her. They abandoned her because it was her own fault. I mean, if you're going to become Miss Havisham and lock yourself up in that apartment in Paris and send for your hairdresser, and then when you're getting ready to go out, say, no, take it down, I'm not going. She doesn't want to face people. It was more and more difficult to be with her because it was, well, most of the time, of course, we spent listening to her records. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, if she didn't watch television, she, watched, she listened to her own records. Shall we listen to some music? Uh, all right. Call us. <laughs> we listened over and over and over to these old tapes. Roles she didn't sing anymore, of course, and they were wonderful. But it did go on. Uh, it was all down memory lane very often. So I sort of thought, what shall I say? So I said, oh, it's marvellous singing, isn't it? She said, marvellous. It isn't marvellous, it's bloody miraculous. And she was right. It is miraculous singing. Finally, a mere two years after Anassis died, Callus suffered a massive heart attack. And on September the 16th, 1977, she too was dead. I think she's somebody who willed herself to death. And that's supreme narcissism. Now, that is odd. I mean, here is this singer who, who gives it everything and who, you know, if her throat were to split from stem to stern and she hemorrhaged to death on the stage, that wouldn't be a problem. But then when she knows that she can't do it anymore to her own standard, she just wills herself to die, it seems to me. Didn't commit suicide. That would be tacky just willed herself to death. I mean, there obviously was an extraordinary willpower in this woman. I went into this room where the first thing that struck me was uh, Maria Callas, the great lady lying on this bed, stretched out in a, in a beautiful gray frock with this glorious hair. So I sat there very quietly for the best part of an hour, I should think. And uh, there was a famous moment in my mind there is this beautiful hair, there's this gorgeous woman, there's the person you've known so much. And in about uh, two hours, she will be destroyed, incinerated, gone forever. I wish I had a pair of scissors to try and cut a lock. Of course, that would have been sacrilege and I would have never done that, but it crossed my mind. I don't see Collis at all as a tragic figure. Certainly she would have because she had a certain paranoia streak in her. But I don't think that tragedy was the end result. I think, you know, if anything, deification was. Uh, I think that already it's not too rash to say that along with perhaps Caruso and Chalyapin, she will dominate the 20th century as one of its most, you know, remarkable creative artists. And uh, that's hardly a tragedy. There's one standard for music, and that is perfect musicianship. Same thing with love. You love, you worship, and you honor. They go together. You never say a lie. You do your best to never betray that person. You cannot love in different manners. There is only one language for that. Only one.
why should the Opera House get money when my local hospital needs kidney machines? Well, of course I could see there were difficult times ahead, but I didn't jump, I was pushed. Financially, we are in crisis. An arrogance that simply took the breath away. It's a shambles, isn't it? I feel as though I'm intruding into a private club which is tolerating my presence with difficulty. I defy Peter Mandelson to put good spin on that lot. Trouble at the House, next Monday at half past nine on BBC Two. On BBC One shortly, biological warfare, the stuff of rumour, is a frightening reality. Plague Wars tells of what's going on in the former Soviet Union. He was an amazingly attractive man. He was just wonderful in all respects. I had a madly immoral passion for him at one point. Everybody's appreciation of form is built on this appreciation of sex. He changed my view of sculpture entirely. On the centenary of his birth, a celebration of the life and work of Henry Moore, carving a reputation starting Saturday at 10 past 8 on BBC Two. A bit of old news for BBC Two now. Remember the one with Ken and Bobby? Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You and we'd like to point out to any confused viewers that this is the first of a brand new series and not a repeat, unless you're watching on Saturday, in which case it's a repeat of the first of this brand new series. <laughs> that, that clarifies things for you. Uh, in the news while we've been away, a Conservative Party spokeswoman admits that keeping Norman Tebbett under control is getting more and more difficult. <laughs> At an EC banquet, an argument develops over who had the garlic bread. And in London, Jonathan Aitken goes on record to insist that his house has no fireplace. <laughs> on Paul Merton's team, we're privileged to have with us the official leader of the opposition. Please welcome Ken Livingstone. <laughs> And with Ian Hislop tonight, a comedian who, when he attempted to play London's comedy store 15 years ago, was greeted with a relentless...